doctors nor bookkeepers, not merchants nor clerks. These men are doctors. Their commodity is health. Their calculating machines are adding and subtracting years of human life. The one with the glasses is typical. Name, Michael Kenneth Marshall, Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Medicine. He's 29 and still a student. Next year, maybe, he'll start practicing his profession. Mike never dreamed he'd find his way into a statistics laboratory when he first came to New York City seven years ago. He'd come fresh from a small college in Ohio after 16 years of academic preparation to enter the medical school of Columbia University. But he knew even then it wasn't just another school he was entering. The Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in Upper Manhattan was in many ways a new world that he himself had chosen. Every day, 1,500 outpatients receive treatment in these clinics. Together with the thousands of bedridden patients in the six hospitals that made up the center, they were also the teaching materials needed by a modern medical school to train doctors and specialists. No, not just another school. The students that registered along with Mike that Tuesday morning seven years ago were entering a school and a hospital a philosophy and a profession. Years later, he would take an oath to serve humanity in the arts of healing. But it was that Tuesday morning when he signed his registration card that Mike knew his heart was set. Maybe he was excited and nervous. Maybe his nonchalance was a pose. Nevertheless, he was sure of himself as he entered medicine. The white, aseptic world of medicine. It would become his world. These smells, these uniforms, the muffled pulse of hospital excitement. He would come to feel at home in these endless corridors. He would learn to use his brain, his hands, his heart to help his fellow man. That morning, he would not have exchanged places with a prince, for he stood on the threshold of his own castle, no longer a dream. Mike entered the world of medicine. The first days were hectic but happy. Mike hardly paid any attention to the comforts of his room with a river view. He was too intrigued by the paraphernalia he was collecting. A microscope of his own. Books with titles that marked the boundaries of his new world. Anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. To a fellow in his frame of mind, even bones weren't gruesome. They were part of the human body. And from now on, the human body was his business. First, he would have to know how it worked under normal circumstances. That was his first subject in the physiology laboratory, learning how to check and measure the mechanism of a healthy man. The students were to use each other as guinea pigs. Normal blood pressure was one of the phenomena they examined. At last, Mike had a real doctor's instrument in his hands. Even its name was something. Sphygmo manometer. Another group worked on lung expansion. The air blown through the tube makes the tank rise. The students were measuring the amount of air they each inhaled and then exhaled. The aural thermometers were not strange, but the readings were. It seemed funny, but no two of these perfectly healthy students had precisely the same temperature. Blood pressure even varied with nervous tension. That's why Mike and his classmates had to learn the normal variations in health before they could expect to recognize disease. Yes, Mike wasn't in this alone. About a hundred other young hopefuls were in his first year class. They worked together and lived together. The dormitory grill was a popular place those first evenings. There were two chaps from California. One wanted to be a general practitioner. The other, a psychiatrist. A Texan whose patients would be cowboys talked with a Kansas girl interested in children's diseases. Lou Wing had come 10,000 miles for surgery. But Mike, like most of his classmates, 
wanted to look around a bit before making definite plans. Besides, the career was a long way off. The bones came first. Ansiform, pisiform, cuneiform. No, memorizing names wasn't important, but you had to call them something when you described their function. Ansiform, pisiform. It was a year before he got to disease. In the pathology lab, he saw the tubercle bacilli that had eroded a man's lung. He studied the X-ray pictures of stomachs and intestines deformed and scarred by the effects of chronic ulcers. He met disease most dramatically of all in the operating room, where much later he assisted in performing laparotomies. Mike was assigned to a place right next to the experienced surgeon. To learn by doing is the best method, but not possible when the subject is life and death. Medical students must learn by helping instead. Now he was part of a disciplined, smooth-working team. The room is hot. The gases smell. Instruments must be passed on time. But hands must be steady. Now let go. Now retract her. Pass the swab. Hold it firm. Get those veins. Pass the swab. Now, nurse. Now, doctor. But it wasn't all work. There were fine tennis courts at the school and time for relaxation, too, and friends. But somehow the talk always got around to medicine, the subject really on Mike's mind. Naturally, he selected companions who were interested in his bright new world. And by the third year, he was really part of it. Most of his days were spent in the hospital wards, learning by helping. Blood is a great indicator of what is going on in the human machine. The few cubic centimeters he would now take for analysis might solve the riddle of this man's fainting spells. But Mike was also learning how to get along with patients. They're just people, of course, but sick people feel sorry for themselves, naturally. And so they're apt to be nervous and grouchy. You have to kid them a bit and give them the confidence you may not have yourself. If the patient guesses that this is your first time at a job, he may imagine pain he doesn't even feel. So you hide your own twinges of fear and doubt and go ahead with the job. The student nurse may know more about this than you do, but that's all right, she's on your side. Both of you are there to help the patient. And meanwhile, you're perfecting your technique. A doctor must be gentle and kind without being soft. Keep your mind on your job. That's it, we're doing fine, all of us. We've got the blood ready to yield its information. Diplomacy, kindness, technical skill, they're all part of your professional equipment. Without them, printed facts and theories can't make you a physician. Medicine is still an art, even though it is based on science. The rest of the analysis was easy. By now, Mike was at home in a clinical pathology lab. He and the other medical students handled pipettes and counting chambers as naturally as they used a knife and fork. As a clinical clerk in his fourth year, Mike had a better opportunity to consider the direction he wanted to follow in medicine. He met more patients, heard the story of their troubles, diagnosed their ailments, and started them on the road to recovery. Most of all, he was impressed with the number of patients who were now suffering from conditions that could be traced to neglect of early symptoms, to bad health habits, or to lack of proper medical care when they were young. They often came to the clinic from five to 25 years too late. Mike wondered if working with children wasn't the way to fight all illness most effectively. The decision was clinched one night during one of those long talk fests that young professionals like because they get a chance to show off to each other. Bill Pearson was talking about how the human lifespan had been lengthened in the last 20 years. Deaths due to diseases of old age have increased simply because more people get old enough to have them nowadays. The boys discussed new victories over microbes, the wonder of penicillin, the advances in brain surgery, the vistas opened by Bogomolet's serum. 
And all the while, Mike reflected. Nowadays, it was more important than ever to reach old age with a healthy body. What good is it for people to live longer if they're worn out and crippled by the diseases of their youth? The thing to do was to catch the trouble in time. Catch it early. Catch it before it does lasting damage. Was this early enough? A month after graduation from medical school, Mike was on duty as an intern in pediatrics. Pediatrics, the promotion of health and the treatment of the diseases of childhood. Full-fledged doctor now, medical degree, state license, responsibility and all. But he was more than a doctor too. For little patients are the most difficult and heartbreaking patients. Mike found he had to be a psychologist, a teacher, an entertainer, and a father as well. This children's hospital was again just one part of a great medical center, supported by generous citizens to teach and to cure at the same time. This was New York Hospital. Together with the Cornell University Medical College and a number of specialized hospitals, it constituted the newest of the great medical centers. It seemed very large, until you considered the size of the community it served. A community that included thousands of underprivileged children who were deprived of fresh air and sunshine. They lacked the ordinary ammunition needed to fight disease, good food, proper living conditions play space and freedom from fear. Some of these children were able to get the medical care they needed at the hospital where Mike now worked. Its entrance was a parking lot for carriages on the days of the well baby clinics. Well babies need regular medical examinations to help them keep well. That is disease prevention. But Mike's experienced eye noticed something his student assistant had overlooked. The unmistakable signs of malnutrition. The breastfed infant boy was well enough, but here was a sick child. She and her parents needed help. She doesn't get many vegetables, does she? Have you ever talked to a member of our social service staff? Wait a minute, Dr. Kennedy will ask her to come in here. Right, doctor? Sure, Mary, we're going to find a way to make you feel better all the time. Instead of sitting around and moping, you'll want to play more with the other kids in the block. You'll like that, won't you? Your work in school will change, too, when you're feeling better. You'll see. The story is all in the case history. Father, unskilled worker, spends a third of income on rent. Six children. Medicine is more than pills and bandages. If you treat people in the hospital and send them home to starve, they'll soon be back in the hospital. That's why trained caseworkers cooperate closely with the medical staff. You come with me, Mary, and let Mother talk about food budgets and eating habits. Rosy cheeks are usually a complicated mixture of string beans, milk, and paychecks. There were plenty of really sick children, too. As an intern, Mike would often present his cases at the grand rounds so that the professor and his assistant could discuss them for the benefit of the assembled staff. Mike had to have the entire case at the tip of his tongue. These were formal occasions. Very often, doctors from other cities and countries joined the audience. Mike had to know symptoms, dates, medical history, family background, the results of dozens of laboratory tests. He had to answer specific questions and all the tiny facts that make up the technical story of an illness. And then the professor checked for himself. After all, he was learning about the case and about Mike as well. As chief of the medical staff, he also had a teaching relationship with the doctors who worked in the hospital. He approved Mike's diagnosis of congenital syphilis and the steps that had been taken to treat it. But he was afraid his prognosis was too optimistic. There were indications that the infection had reached the nervous system and probably the brain. If the child did live, which was not too likely, it would be years before a complete recovery could be expected. But it was the prenatal history of this case that particularly interested the professor. Why had the mother not been examined and then treated in time? 
he tended to see the doomed child as another example of the tragic results of a neglected case of infectious disease. Mike was still learning, even though he was doing at the same time, and teaching a bit. Miss Brewster, the head night nurse, was an old timer. She had been nursing nearly 25 years with wide open eyes and mind. She knew her business, but Mike, as a doctor and a recent graduate, knew a few things that even she could learn. New things, like the characteristics of the penicillin he was preparing for injection. She was surprised to learn it didn't matter if the dose was too big. It wasn't like the sulfur drugs. Penicillin has no toxic effect. Large amounts can be given with perfect safety. It was a nice feeling to give something in exchange for all the help and goodwill that had been coming his way. And it was still coming, for Mike was still a student. The men who taught in the center's medical school held frequent staff seminars on special aspects of children's diseases. They might be illustrated by extraordinary cases that were in the hospital for treatment. The spasm in a case of anorexia nervosa is not something every physician gets to see in his lifetime. But that is one of the advantages of working in a teaching hospital. Because this illness has a psychic basis, it must not be discussed in the presence of the patient. But when the 13-year-old girl has been taken back to the ward, the child psychiatrist can review the details of the strange illness. The youngster wants to starve herself to death rather than face the problems of growing up. Her confusion involves many factors, some of them reaching back into early childhood. First, she must be nourished, but the real treatment will concern her mind and her attitudes toward her environment. The doctors are deeply interested for more and more they are coming across physical illness that can only be traced to a mental source. When doctors stop learning, the saying goes, they're through being doctors. The pleasantest of Mike's duties was visiting the occupational therapy porch. The children who could leave their beds spent many happy hours here, hours that helped them get over the shock of being separated from home and family. And while Mike seemed to play with them, he was carefully observing them. A big part of a doctor's job is to know what's going on in those little heads. And gradually, he began to know more about himself and what he wanted to do in medicine. He envied his colleagues who were completely satisfied with their careers. Like Jim Gleason, who could talk forever about the advantages of working with children, about the important research work still to be done in the field. Mike listened and agreed. He liked his work but he felt it wasn't what he really wanted to do. As usual, the philosophic discussion was interrupted by duty. The call was for Mike, from the admitting clerk in the emergency room. It seemed routine and Mike expected to be back in a few minutes. Throat's pretty bad. Not much fever, but I don't like her extreme weakness. I think you'd better wait upstairs. We'll have to make tests before we know anything definite. Will you show them the way, Miss Abbott? I'll be with you in a little while. Her throat is almost black, and the swelling up there at the angle of the jaw. No, Kate, I'll try not to hurt. I know you feel pretty awful. I just want to see how your tonsils are. You'll be feeling better very soon. Masks, Miss Grant. All contagion precautions. Don't we look funny, Kate? All dressed up? No, not that. We'll take cultures first. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think I know what we've got here. Now, this will be over in a minute, and then we'll take you to a nice room. All for yourself. I know your tongue hurts. I'll try not to touch it. There. Good girl. Miss Grant, call the chief. Get these to the lab. And I want diphtheria antitoxin. Yes, diphtheria. Your little girl's pretty ill. Of course, we're not sure yet what it is, but we're doing everything we possibly can. Tell me, 
Did she ever have diphtheria shots? Why, no, I don't think so. You see, we moved here from out of town last June. Kate did well up here. She only complained about her throat Sunday night. We thought it was tonsillitis like she had last November. But it was different then. She had a terrible fever. Well, that's why we weren't worried this time. Do you think it's diphtheria? It might be. We'll know in a little while. You'd better wait there in the next room. We'll bring Kate upstairs now and get her comfortable. Diphtheria. That's what Alice Cannon's kid died of. It can't be diphtheria. The resident and his assistant are always on call for emergencies. They agreed with Mike. It looked too much like diphtheria to take a chance waiting for culture reports. Antitoxin was definitely indicated. No, no, I mustn't think of that. It can't happen, it can't. She'll pull out of this. Please, Lord, we've always tried to give her what she needed. This is the world Mike chose for himself. This is medicine when the going's hard. The art that is based on science. New victories over microbes. But would the antitoxin work? Four days is too long in diphtheria. Steady, Dr. Mike. This is the time to keep your mind on the job. Truth always hurts, yet not telling is even crueler. We're pretty sure it's diphtheria now. We've given her an injection of antitoxin and some medicine to stop her pain. She's more comfortable since we put her in an oxygen tent. Don't worry, that's just to help her breathe easier. The thing we're most worried about is her heart. It's under great strain. It's the usual thing for the staff to have a cup of coffee down at the nurse's station after night rounds. But that night, the resident had to pry Mike away from the child's bed. Mike hardly seemed to be in the room. The resident kidded him and scolded him, but nothing worked. Mike couldn't relax. It was this race against time. A couple of days sooner and it would have been another story. You're wanted right away, Dr. Marshall, 422. Will you come along? I'm afraid this is it. This is medicine, too. Pediatrics? Why pediatrics? It only makes it that much harder when you lose. Catch it early. This isn't early enough. You've got a new admission, infant's ward. Sure you feel licked, Mike, but you never had a chance. We got it too late. You can't hit yourself for that, son. You lost one, but you'll save hundreds before the year is over. Look at it that way. You did your best. Isn't that enough? But it wasn't enough for Mike. He finished his training in pediatrics, working in the clinics and the wards, learning more and more about his young patients, 
being able to help them more and more. But his mind was made up. He would not open an office and treat sick children as Jim Gleason was going to do. Pediatrics wasn't to be his lifetime job. Somehow he'd probably get involved with kids, but he still had to go further to find his true place in medicine. He did go the next year to Baltimore, to Johns Hopkins University. He came seeking strength and guidance to one of the best known of all American medical schools. Humbly he came, for by now he knew that besides art and science, the healer must have a deep, true inner strength. He had been awarded a fellowship at the School of Hygiene and Public Health, and thus at the age of 28, again became a student. It meant going back to the classroom and the laboratory. It meant tiresome hours relearning techniques that he had lost from lack of practice. Was this class in bacteriology the road forward? Or was it a retreat to the protection of academic walls? Only time could tell. Mike got some reassurance from the men who worked next to him. Many had come from distant lands, after years of good work among their own peoples, to prepare themselves for public health careers. They, too, were learning preventive techniques. They, too, wanted to catch the trouble early, to fight all illness. But that didn't necessarily mean it was interesting work. Calculating the incidence of industrial accidents in the state of Michigan cannot be expected to inspire a recent pediatrician. Yet statistics are an important part of public health work. One great consolation in this period was Mike's return to family life. He had found a furnished room in the home of a telephone mechanic, the first private home he had lived in for more than five years. It was nice to live with real people again, people who weren't either doctors or patients, children he could relax with and not worry about day and night. Here were parents he could face without fear. It was good to talk about politics and the weather for a change. They lived near the school in a poor part of Baltimore. Their house was a little brick building with the typical marble steps, just like the next one, and the one after that. Just like the building that housed the Eastern Health District offices and clinic. This modest institution was run jointly by Mike's school and the city health department. The old, familiar combination of teaching and doing. The center was headquarters for the visiting nurses of the neighborhood. It provided free x-ray service to help in the nationwide fight against tuberculosis. It ran well baby clinics for the many families who could not afford private medical care. And before the babies were born, their mothers had come to the prenatal clinic for examination and advice. This part of the new schooling made Mike feel at home again. There was nothing academic about going along with a visiting nurse while she made her rounds in the slum streets like those hidden away in so many cities. These were the people who needed medicine the most. Sickness wasn't something that struck them from time to time. They lived with it all their lives. They almost took it for granted. Malaria, tuberculosis, Anemia, trichinosis, scabies, ringworm, pellagra. They didn't know the names, of course, but they knew the aches and pains only too well. Some of Mike's excursions were to pleasanter places. Water supply and purification is another subject in the public health curriculum. And so is epidemic control. The course started with a study of the famous outbreak of cholera in London back in 1854. It was the first epidemic that had been scientifically tracked down street after street by the corpses that had left in its deadly wake. Mike learned to chart the movement of infection, a lesson that proved useful sooner than he expected. For in October, the maps of the Eastern Health District began to bristle with disease. Health officers and epidemiology professors recognized an abnormal increase in diphtheria. Every day, more cases were rushed to the city hospital for contagious diseases. The entire district was threatened, a district where thousands of children were living in overcrowded homes that invited the spread of infection. A call went out for volunteers to help fight the threat of an epidemic. 
Some of the students at the School of Hygiene and Public Health answered the call. And Mike was among them. To him, diphtheria had a special significance. But this wasn't London in 1854. Something could be done to stop the ride of death this time. Science has learned to make war on epidemics. The meeting in the little district health office was very much like a military staff meeting, where a campaign is planned and strategy is worked out. The mobilization call was posted everywhere. Diphtheria threatens you. Come to the district clinic for your toxoid. The same call went out to the mothers of the neighborhood. It was taken from door to door by the visiting nurses who made sure that the warning was understood. The danger is real to your children. See that they get to the clinic. Mass mailings of the call went out to all the families listed in the health department records. Nurses went back to check on old patients who had families. The call was sent in bulk to schools and churches. It was posted and passed about into every corner of the district. The clarion had sounded. The fight against diphtheria had started. Mass immunization was to be the first big push. The turnout was gratifying. Hundreds of children rounded up by worried parents, teachers and ministers appeared at the district health clinic to get their injections of toxoid. For medicine has a strong defense against the diphtheria bacillus. It uses the poison of the germ itself, weakened of course, to prevent the disease. But it must be used before the real infection has been caught. So this becomes a battle of hypodermic syringes. The more children injected in time, the fewer the cases. Mike worked long hours wielding needles in this battle with his old enemy. His clinical experience, too, was helpful these troubled days and nights when he worked round the clock. He often used the antitoxin that had once failed him. The difference this time was in not having to use it a couple of days too late. Mike had caught up in the race against time. As soon as he could get home, he took care of the children with whom he lived. They were in special danger because of his own frequent contacts with infection. And if they caught diphtheria because of him, well, the toxoid would prevent that. These shots were special ones in Mike's personal battle. Sure, the needle hurts a little, but nothing like a bad case of diphtheria, Mike knew. And many families in the district now knew it too. As the fall turned into winter, the hospital admissions grew at an ever-increasing rate. Children were brought in suffering with all aspects of the malady. Some had passed the crisis and only required good nursing care and isolation. But others hovered between life and death as toxin and antitoxin struggled for supremacy. Others had needed surgery, for often cutting open the throat is the only way to keep the child from choking to death as a result of swollen membranes that block the air passages. Meanwhile, Mike found that the Baltimore school teachers were ready to do their full share in this fight. He told them how they could pass the word on to the children, the word that might keep the youngsters alive. Health education was another sector of the grand battle. Every known method of spreading the word was used. Ignorance must not serve as a weapon for the enemy. And the toxoid came to those who could not come to it. Mike knew that his tiring rounds were less tiring than the visits he or some other physician would have to make if diphtheria got there first. But the strain on all the medical personnel was enormous. The nurses usually spent their evenings reporting on the work of crowded days. The call for doctors seemed unceasing as the outbreak reached its peak. The neighborhood practitioners and the doctors who had volunteered to help them never seemed to catch up on the visits and rounds. There was always one more case to see. The usual early winter illnesses, flu and pneumonia, began to compete for their attention as diphtheria went on striking down the youngsters of all classes. In some cases, the toxoid shots had been given too late. A spectator today might be a patient tomorrow. A worried mother one day might become a frantic mother the next. 
And while the outbreak was fought, the search went on for the main source of infection. Mike joined the city officials who visited the district schools. They checked the supposedly healthy youngsters, for often disease carriers are themselves immune. The doctors found two little girls who had suspicious nasal infections. Bacterial cultures made from these might yield an answer. They did, an answer that was discussed promptly at a staff meeting. The two youngsters had been giving diphtheria to their schoolmates. Now quarantined and under treatment, they would no longer serve as innocent agents of death. The diphtheria outbreak could be expected to subside. This battle had been won. But disease cannot be shut off like a water tap. Mike went on helping out in the contagious wards that were still jammed. Now his internship was paying dividends. He checked case histories and worried about the beats of a hundred little fighting hearts as the children blossomed back to normalcy after a successful fight against death. They looked well, but diphtheria has a treacherous way of leaving hidden trouble. The youngsters still needed care and rest to keep them well. Mike forgot how to be tired. Often the sun came up before a night's work was over. Yes, here he was coming home from work at nine o'clock in the morning. He was more weary and worn out than a man should ever be. But at last he had caught up. These were almost his kids now. He had helped save their lives. He could let them go off to school knowing they were safe from diphtheria. Although he hadn't seen them for weeks, he'd been a good doctor to them. The road through anatomy, bacteriology, pathology, pediatrics, biostatistics, public health had taken him forward. Mike at last had found his place. Yes, this was it. This was medicine for him. Mike's mind is on the youngsters of the community where he'll go to work next year. Brazil, China maybe, Alabama. Michael Kenneth Marshall, BS, MD, MPH, will be well prepared for the job. Thank you.